So today we're going to explore two more gas laws, the last two gas laws. They're both very important to you. Number one, the funniest that. sounding gas law of all is Gay-Lussac. Okay, that was the guy's name. He was a French guy. All right, he's going to help you understand why you can have a basketball that is flat, 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 lost all its bounds in the morning, and then after a hot day, you come up in the evening, and it bouncy, 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 bouncy. Gay Lussac explains that. The other one we're going to deal with is combined law, which was proposed by a, another French scientist, Joseph Combined. And it just so happens, coincidentally, if you believe me, that Combined, Dr. Combined, combined all the laws together to form one law. And that's why we call it Combined Law, named after Joseph Combined. And who believes me that Joseph Combined? No one? No one? That's because it's a lie. It is called the Combined Law because it combines. And that is going to be a very important law because it will explain what you're going to be eating, oh, about a week and a half from now when you go to the cinema to watch Avengers. Age of Ultron popcorn. So the combined law will explain popcorn. Number 25. We have seen what effect temperature and pressure has on a volume of gas. What about the effect that temperature has on the pressure of gas? Okay, let's review. Boyle's law told us that as pressure increased, volume decreased. Vice versa. They were inversely related. Charles' law tells us that as temperature goes up, volume goes up, so they are directly related. Okay, Gay-Lussac is going to tell us that as temperature goes up, pressure goes up. They are also directly related. As temperature goes up, pressure goes up. Now, watch this, and you tell me, how does this explain the basketball? True story. During one of the coldest stretches of the winter, I started up my car and saw this warning light. That's right, the tire pressure light. An easy fix, unless it's a flat. So I jumped out of my car and was happy to find, in fact, it wasn't a flat. The tires just needed a little air. Thinking back to high school chemistry class, I decided this makes complete sense. Remember the equation, the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, where P is pressure, V is volume, N and R are constants, and T is temperature? Well, the air in your tire is a gas, so it more or less adheres to this equation. Assuming the volume of your tire does not change, the ideal gas law basically says that as temperature changes, so changes the pressure. So imagine the air molecules in your tires as just a bunch of little tiny orbs. The tire pressure can be thought of then as how often these orbs collide with the walls of the tire. When it's warm, the molecules will move around all over the place, bouncing off the walls and each other constantly, and hence, pressure is higher. When it's cold, however, the molecules slow down, collide with the walls of the tire less, and so pressure drops. It's a good idea to keep your tire pressure a little higher in the winter then. Most tires suggest keeping the pressure at 32 PSI. Keep in mind, you may have to let a little bit of that air out when warmer weather returns in the spring and summer months. All right, so who can explain to me what happened to Ben's basketball? Why did his mommy come out and take out a pump and pump up the basketball while he was out working? What happened, Asher? That's right. That's right. The basketball stayed out all day. It was a hot day. So as the temperature went up, the molecules bounced around more, increased the pressure. So he was able to play for a little while because the pressure was up artificially due to the temperature. His mommy did not pump it up. That would have been the permanent way of solving it because after spending, after he just tosses it out there in the yard again and it cools down overnight, what happens when he picks it back up in the morning? The bounce is gone. The temperature went down, the molecules are moving around slower, so they're not bouncing against the side of the container as much pressure goes down. This also explains that during the winter months you should be very careful. Be aware that especially if it gets really cold, you may have to add a little more air 
to your tires. Why? Yeah, the molecules are going to slow down, and if the molecules slow down, there's less collisions, and if there's less collisions, there, it, it, there is less pressure. Okay? During the heat of the summer, even if your tires are not leaking any air at all, you need to be concerned that there may be too much or too little pressure. Too much pressure, you may have to let some of the pressure out. It's not a big deal for us here in East Tennessee, but out west it can be because you may be driving around and it's 110 degrees and the road may actually be hotter than that. So you can easily blow out a tire during the summer months. Okay, one time I was uh, planning to go uh, drive my camper all the way out to California. Okay, and they warned me once you got to Las Vegas and you have to pass desert. And during the summer months, it gets really, really hot and there are blowouts of tires if the tire pressure is not inflated properly. So which law describes this phenomenon? Gay-Lussac's law. P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. Let's combine it with combined law. If given pressure, temperature, and volume, I can use the combined law to mathematically calculate the missing variable. All right? Why do we have to use the combined law? Because let's try to remember. PV equals K was Boyle's law. Pressure and volume equals K. It's, we saw it like this. P1, V1 equals P2, V2 if temperature remains the same. Then Charles' law was V over T equals K. I told you that it was like this. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. That's just a way of algebraically setting it up. If pressure was the same, then finally, P over T equals K. P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2 if volume is the same. Why is it unrealistic to expect all those variables to be the same? It's During the course of today, the temperature is going to change. Even in the lab, the temperature, you go into the lab, the temperature changes. You turn on the Bunsen burner, the temperature changes. It's hard to maintain the temperature steady. Through the course of the day, the pressure is going to change. Unless you are in some kind of uh, special room where you have to enter in a special way and they can control the pressure, it's going to change just because air pressure changes throughout the day. Okay? Volume is a whole lot easier to control, but pressure and temperature are difficult to control. So, can anyone tell me how can you combine all these laws together? What would it look like? Go. Yes, Frank. Can anyone tell me what it looks like to combine all the laws together? Where should P be? In the numerator or denominator? Numerator. V, look at it, V is consistently in the <coughs> numerator, T, T is consistently in the
T1 times V1 equal over T1 equals P2 times V2 all over T2. If you don't believe me, check the back of your periodic table, the gas laws. This law explains. <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm Ben. I'm Lauren. This is Brain Stuff. Oh, right, yeah. And today's, yeah, that's why we're here. Today's question is, how does popcorn work? Yeah, it's weird. You take a uh, pouch that's no bigger than a wallet, you put it in a microwave oven for like three minutes, and suddenly it's expanded to 40 or 50 times its original size. What? It's pretty wild, but there are actually three really simple elements that make it work this way. So first you've got, there's, there's moisture inside the kernel. Then you've got starch, also inside the kernel. And then the kernel itself is, is, a, is a hard but not too hard shell that's completely surrounding everything else in there. Oh, okay, so when a popcorn kernel heats up, either in a popcorn popper or in a microwave oven, that moisture inside the kernel turns into steam and it tries to expand. Right, right, but it's, but it's prevented from doing so by that hard shell. Eventually, when the pressure builds up enough, it will, it will explode. Okay, well, that, that part seems kind of normal. Like, I don't want to... I don't want to be sketchy or anything, but a lot of things explode when you eat them. Right? <laughs> not, that, not that we know anything about right. that here. Yeah. Okay, but the, yeah. <laughs> cool. the strange part is the white solid stuff that forms during this process. Yeah? Uh, well, it's not really that weird either. I mean, bread and muffins do that, mm. albeit at a much slower pace, and technically that's a chemical reaction, not a physical one. If you really want to see popcorn in action, uh, there are three experiments you can perform to get a better understanding of these principles. Yeah, I forgot the first one. The first one, uh, and, and it's really it's really experiments of inaction. You can take a push pin or a needle and use that to puncture the shells of some popcorn kernels. Oh. Uh, wear wear safety goggles when you do this. Yeah. It's harder than it looks. But but yeah, so 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 these these things won't pop once they've been punctured because the pressure cannot build up inside the shells enough to do so. Oh, and uh, the second one, uh, you can let new kernels stand in a warm oven or in the sun for a few hours and then try popping them, right? Right, because that will dry them out. Yep, and they won't pop nearly as well. Yeah, no, I mean really, really low, ineffective rate of popping, really. Minimum poptitude. Third, well, you can try to pop popcorn at a low temperature, like below 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, which is 149 Celsius. Good call. It won't pop. The moisture inside the kernel will turn to steam at water's boiling point which is uh, uh, 100 degrees Celsius, aka 212 degrees Fahrenheit. You are crazy good at this. And it will liquefy the starch, but it has to get above 300 degrees for the pressure inside the kernel to build to that point where the shell explodes. Right. Once it does so, the, the, the soft starch will burst out, and due to the relatively cool air outside of it, it will cool down really rapidly to form that unique popped kernel that we all know and love. Which is like a snowflake that you can eat at the movies. I, I love delicious snowflakes. That's great. I mean. All right. So they explained to you the basic concept, but they didn't show you it actually popping. That's for the slow mo guys to do that. Who's ever seen a video behind the slow mo guy? <laughs> Hello. Welcome to this slow motion video. It's not like a cooking show. <laughs> Popcorn. So we've got some popcorn, it's the microwave right, stuff, I hope it works. Do you want to light that bad boy up? Yeah. No, I'm not yeah, that's hot. So, go! Do you like cooking shows? Yeah, I love cooking shows. First, add the popcorn. I've always wanted to do this. Have you? Yeah. you never done it? No. What? It's like half made. Oh, I go, I go. Oh, see you later. Look at that. We'll wait for it to leave. There we go. <laughs> okay, so popcorn is a very special breed of corn. It has a tough exterior, as that lady said, and a little bit of moisture, just enough. It is just perfect. The tough, the, the exterior is not too tough, but it's tough enough and the interior has not too much water but just enough water so as the popcorn heats up the steam that water turns into steam it has nowhere to go 
So the pressure builds up until finally the outside, the pericarp, bursts open. And the steam comes out, and as it comes out, it puffs up all the starch around it. So as amazing as it is, that big flaky flour was all compacted deep inside. Now the other thing that bothers me about this video is this dude right here sits there and allows himself to get sprayed with hot oil the entire video and he'll complain about it, but he doesn't have enough intelligence to get away! Let's put one on there. Get that buttery one. Yes! Oh. <laughs> Makes you hungry, doesn't it? <laughs> what? Frame now, but this is at 10,000 frames a second. Oh, ah! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, we got it. Ah, whoa! Let's re refresh our memories because STP will become an important thing here. What is STP? Standard temperature and pressure. What is standard temperature? All you have to do is remember two numbers. Zero. And? Hundred. Zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. Zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. And what is zero degrees Celsius in Kelvin? 273. So all you have to do, remember, for STP is 0 and 1. But you do need to also remember that you should never have it in Celsius. What will happen to the volume <coughs> X of a gas at T and P if originally was V? T, P. All right. They want to know what happens to a volume of gas if you change its temperature and pressure. P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. Originally means original conditions. P1, they didn't tell us. Well, yeah, they did. Standard pressure is? <coughs> volume. Standard temperature is 0 plus 273.
they changed the pressure to they want to know what happens to the volume and they change the temperature to all right so it's one times 2.5 times 293 equals 273 times 1.5 times x. X should be an answer that's close to 2.5. Crossed, multiply. One point seven. One point eight. Okay, they gave it to you in one decimal place, so please give it back to them in one decimal place. A three liter sample V at T and P has its pressure P and temperature T. What is the new volume? Same as before. That is standard pressure. Calculate, please. <coughs> Bailey, you got an answer? It should be close to three point oh. in the ballpark of 3.0. Okay. okay. It has two decimal places, so... Is that what you got, Bailey? Yeah. One more. You go on and do this one. Go on, Devon. Devon.
Y'all agree? I changed it. They don't. They didn't ask me to change it to Celsius, but I changed it to Celsius because I think some of your homework questions will ask you to change it to Celsius. Yes, Ben. Um, okay, so the temperature is twenty-five, right? Yes, so Ben. You, you always add two temperatures to it. Always. You cannot use it in Celsius. All right. <coughs> For homework, I want you to do questions 6 through 10, which is gas law questions. So you have to use one of the four gas laws that I taught you. And you actually have to identify which gas law. So by now, you should be able, tomorrow, for worksheet 4.2, you should have 1 through 10 done, and then 13 through... 21, 13 through 21.